Okay, uh, I hope you can see the slide, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. I think now we can start, sir. But uh, before yeah. you start, sir, let me read out your sir brief uh, CV. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. So uh, today we have an expert, uh, Dr. Thinagaran Perumal, sir. Uh, he is currently associate professor at Department of Computer Science. Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology, University of Putra, Malaysia. He is currently also chair of IEEE Consumer Electronics Society, Malaysia. Sir, interest is mainly in Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, smart homes, and interoperability and ambience intelligence. So, uh, sir has also recipient of a 2014 Early Career Award from IEEE Consumer Electronics Society for his pioneering contribution in the field of consumer electronics. He completed his PhD at University of Putra, Malaysia in the area of smart technology and robotics. He is also currently appointed as a head of a cyber physical system de uh, department in the university itself and also been acted as a chair of IEEE Consumer Electronics Society Malaysia chapter. He is, his current research are towards the interoperability aspect of the smart home and internet of things as well as cyber physical system along with the variable computing. He is also heading the national committee on a standardization for IoT as a chairman since 2018. Some of the eminent work include proactive architecture for IoT system, development of cognitive IoT framework for a smart homes and variable device for a rehabilitation purpose. He is an active member of IEEE Consumer Electronic Society and Future Direction Committee of the IoT. He has been invited to give several talks for a IOT and related to field. He is currently also a reviewer, serving as a reviewer in a IEEE conferences and a journal. So currently, sir has a Scopus Edge Index is 13 with more than 460 plus citation and Google Scholar Edge Index is 15 and I10 Index is 19 with having a more than 727 uh, citation. So, sir has currently working in a different six project which is related to the IoT field. Now, I welcome sir to proceed. Yeah, sir. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for the... Uh, uh, actually, I'm glad to be on board today. And, uh, and if you look at the topic, uh, the scope is actually quite huge. Um, but luckily, we have like um, uh, two more modules uh, on a separate days uh, to cover. And um, I'll do my best to give you some key takeaways on uh, how to get started on Internet of Things and uh, how do you uh, uh, begin your uh, early research, uh, probably some new project scopes, uh, the directions, uh, as well as the, some baseline uh, fundamentals that one need to know before um, getting started in the area of uh, IoT. So um, this topic today, consumer-centric, um, Internet of Things, catalyzing the need of interoperability. Uh, we like to see some of the um, um, uh, possible way uh, of how do we uh, build a new IoT ecosystem and uh, what are the components actually needed um, to get started in IoT, right? So um, I think in the past few days, you, has, uh, you had a lot of um, uh, interesting topics uh, especially on the machine learning and um, some cross areas. Um, many of these areas are actually very much relevant um, to the um, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, the only thing is that in, in research community, uh, we are yet to see the, the huge potential of IoT due to the lack of uh, understanding on the architecture. And uh, of course, we will see a little bit on the uh, uh, standard factors which might be helpful for beginners, uh, you know, to get uh, involved in this area. Um, I think everybody um, is quite familiar. I think um, um, probably the syllabus in, in the media, okay, um, uh, on the web that you read, um, probably you have done some projects on Internet of Things, right? Um, though it's not a new technology, it's been there since 1998, uh, but uh, just recently, um, IoT has taken a different dimension. It become a strategic technology trend due to machine learning and you know um, uh, AI that are actually pushing IoT to the edge border. 
um, and it's seen as a mega trend and uh, also a game changer, right, in many areas. And I think uh, it wouldn't be surprising that uh, when we are talking about post-COVID-19 era, uh, a lot of um, IoT projects are mushrooming, right? And uh, this could actually trigger a new transformation, uh, possibly some uh, economical impact on the trillion dollar market. And uh, we could see this as a next big thing and uh, in a different ways. But uh, gentlemen, I think um, it's very important for us to understand that uh, the broad sense of IoT is quite huge in the ecosystem, right? So uh, it is very important for us being an academic or even from industry uh, to narrow down the scope of IoT uh, pertaining to a project or, or what we call as a vertical domains or even a horizontal domains, right? So uh, understanding a domain is very important for you to uh, get started uh, or enabling IoT into the projects. And I, I will show you in a short while. So before we go further, I think um, it's very important for us to understand what IoT objects are all about, right? So um, general notion that we know that people talks about IoT devices, okay? Yes, uh, it is true, okay? Um, we, we normally um, white papers, right? Even um, academic syllabus will actually um, uh, define those as devices, right? Uh, but a correct term would be, we, we normally call um, those devices, even sub-devices or the sensor nodes as objects, okay? So objects carries a huge context, indeed. So um, these objects, right, often they are categorized into uh, three different categories, right? The first would be what we call as a passive object. So this passive object, uh, it's just like your tag, you know, um, some some of pointer, um, just like your um, smart cards, right? That, that your ID card that you use in campus that has some information. That's it. Uh, it it's merely storing information, but uh, there's no triggering, there's no um, actuating kind of thing, right? So generally, it has the contextualized info like um, location, probably, right? Uh, in um, some countries, the toll plaza they use um, this kind of passive cards. Okay, to uh, for the uh, toll payment and so on, right? So passive objects is very common, right? Um, and it is one of the huge contributor for IoT objects at the recent time. Okay, so this would be the first category. The second category is actually the reactive objects. Uh, this is more like you know when you switch on something, it should trigger something. So just like a switch at home and you turn it on and off, right? Um, uh, a simple example would be like um, home automation, like you know when when you want to turn your um, aircon, um, it reaches twenty degrees Celsius, you know it stops heating. So uh, there are some mechanism that actually uh, refers to some data, and based on the data, it sets the threshold, and the threshold will actually trigger something. So there are some events, um, the condition and action that happens uh, with this kind of reactive objects. Um, if you look at the current scenario, a lot of um, uh, IoT devices are actually uh, reactive objects, right? Or we are actually here in reactive objects. And uh, if you look at most of the startups product, they are very much focusing on this kind of uh, reactive objects because due to the market internationally, right? Uh, the third one. Uh, sorry to interview, sir. Tina, sir, I don't go. I yeah. hope you are on the. Title slide only, sir. Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, just a minute. I, I think, think uh, means, uh, we are unable to see your slide All change. Right. Okay. I think yes. we are at the title slide only. Sorry. Okay. Can, you, can you see now the changes of the slide? Uh, no, sir. We are at the title slide only. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Um. Uh, now, now, now we are at the outline. Slides. Okay. 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 All right. So no, no worries. Okay. I'll, I'll go back again. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and thanks for pointing out, Dr. Amit. Uh, okay. I appreciate that. All right. So, um, okay. Uh, well, I think uh, I, I'll just sum up. Okay. Um, uh, I think we missed two of the slides here. So um, we started with the general notions on the IoT, the key components, right? And then um, we uh, talked about uh, about the uh, trend how this uh, IoT would actually uh, transform the next big thing. 
Okay, and uh, we are here actually. Um, uh, it's very important to to understand the objects of um, Internet of Things. Uh, generally, we know that uh, the notions given is actually devices or sensors, right? Whenever people um, outline about IoT, they talk about sensors, wireless sensors, okay, uh, even devices or network devices. But a correct way of addressing them is actually we call them as IoT objects. So these IoT objects, all right, uh, they can be categorized into um, three different um, categories, right? Uh, the first would be passive object, uh, which has some um, information, all right? It's merely information. It doesn't have anything else. And then, and then uh, it has some contextualized info like um, a location, just like your you know, campus ID, or probably you have some um, uh, smart card, right? That actually has some chip and it, it just stores some information. That's it, right? Nothing else. Then the second category is actually the reactive objects. Okay, you um, many of the current product or the work done, they are very much focused on this kind of reactive objects. So a typical example would be like a switch at home where we turn it on and off, a smart meter, right? Or you can just call it any air condition um, control, remote control, if you have a decoder box at home. So these are all reactive objects. When you have, it has some event, it has some condition, and if you match the condition or the threshold, it has to trigger something, right? So currently the market uh, for IoT ecosystem focuses on reactive objects. And many of the uh, startup, um, most of the products are actually based on this kind of uh, reactive objects, right? And the third category, this is the philosophy that we are looking at for IoT, what we call as autonomous object of things, right? So autonomous objects, they should perform functionality without human intervention, uh, with some decision making, and of course, some predictive value, right? So there are many facets involved in um, coming up with autonomous objects, but indeed the IoT, philosophy is actually to achieve or to transform the objects around us as autonomous objects. So we have vending machine or an intelligent fridge that tells us um, the content, all right, or the stock or the groceries uh, that's going to be expired, or, you know, or, or new stock needed, or probably it has to um, do some decision making by itself, right, without our intervention. And even you know purchasing or costing uh, remotely, so um, it could have some contextualized info that probably some uh, mobile vacuum um, cleaner that could do some household for us, uh, you know, uh, based on the dust uh, density. So th there are always data associated with this kind of autonomous object. Unfortunately, we don't have much um, autonomous objects around us because of the diversification of industrial focus, right? And uh, the moment we talk about autonomous object, the first thing comes to our mind is actually um, driverless, uh, you know, uh, vehicle, self-driving car, probably um, 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 EV, electric vehicles, right? So uh, just like Tesla, right, uh, car that, that comes, to, comes to our mind. So this kind of autonomous object is something that we should uh, uh, look for uh, in the coming years. Okay, and this is going to be the real philosophy of the uh, uh, IoT objects. So a typical object should have ID, okay, identification, very, very important because in the internet of things, you're, you're talking about large scale of devices, right? So the naming, the addressing is actually uh, an important criteria. So uh, if you remember, I think uh, some of the audience probably from the networking background might remember that we have this uh, IPv4, uh, version of addressing and today we have IPv6 so though even though we have IPv6 the, uh, it is very under underutilized actually so um, addressing or naming uh, is actually an important um, criteria and uh, many standard bodies are actually focusing on the addressing and uh, you know the naming uh, consensus um, say you are focusing on um, you're deploying a thousand of sensors and each sensor should be uniquely identified and this object should have some attributes um, like type of sensors, um, measures, okay, and even location or other relations attributes. Um, perhaps one more layer would be authentication and authorization attributes.
and perhaps you know um um uh, authorization and authentication could could be more likely on the uh, security part right so uh, we will see that shortly so uh, if you asked about uh, the definition right from a uh, different uh, stakeholders they would have they would come up with a different um, meaning right so if we ask a database um, uh, analyst they would come up with uh, something called portal if you ask an engineer they will say that it's a custom system integration if you ask a medical practitioner they would say it's a clinical and financial connectivity so it's like uh, multi facets definition is there but they all boils down to one single definition right uh, even though right many of the um, international bodies um, actually uh, looking at the uh, common um, definition on the uh, network infrastructure okay but i have to stress here that um, though many of these um, international bodies like uh, international telecommunication union um, 1m2m uh, internet engineering foundation at sea okay um, they are focusing on on the communication infrastructure but uh, the, the the unique definitions carried by iot is more than that right but um, it's been a trend that uh, much of these standards are being developed by um, uh, telcos or telecommunication service providers so i think a good um, uh, complex comprehensive definition would, for iot would be a system with in a network of networks uh, typically a massive number of objects things sensors or devices are connected through um, communications and uh, information infrastructure to provide value added services okay and the keyword here is actually the value added services right and um, why are intelligent data processing and management for different applications like uh, smart cities smart health smart grid smart home and you know um, smart transportation or even smart shopping right so um, anything that has to do with smart uh, would be a good uh, vertical domains for iot but the keyword that we have to pay attention is actually the value added services via intelligent data processing and this is what we want to achieve when you have we have an iot ecosystem right so on a very simple term i think um just to put it like like world wide web okay uh, like our browser we choose to connect but the moment we have been to talk things okay the only option we have is actually to choose to disconnect so the communication among these objects do not need any um, human intervention right so just simple like that so for consumers okay or for consumers or users like us um the expectation is very high and we are likely likely to see some convergence of the type of technology um telecommunications uh, the type of data that we're going to um, obtain and how going to impact our, our site the consumers and how it's going to influence the uh, consumer electronics industry uh will there be any values just like we are using our mobile phone for productivity and you know uh, probably our social media right would there be any need or uh, complications and i think the most important will be humanizing the technology right so uh, i think uh, many well uh, well known researchers okay um, i think among our audience today they they, they do agree that uh, many of today's research areas are inclined towards sustainable development goals right sdg that actually um uh, highlighted by the united nations right so um countries like in asia like even in india or singapore or malaysia okay or we are more likely uh, impacted with the uh, uh, social structure that actually needs lots of works on sustainable development okay? I, i will share with you some important insights on that so a lot of applications are there okay and how do you choose them um it, it's not an easy task for every um you know um researcher or even um, pg students postgraduate students right um how to get started with this kind of uh, how do i choose the right um um you know like um applications or domain right so um a lot of uh, aspects involved right but if you look at the standard documents right um the the highlight is always about automotive right it's a very big industry um healthcare 
um, home automation, industrial utilities, uh, smart grid, and smart city. But uh, I would like to um, highlight that. Uh, just remember that not every use cases are suitable for us. Uh, probably for us, uh, healthcare uh, and smart city would be ideal. In, in the case of India, I think uh, smart city is the right um, use case uh, due to the population density and um, the social structure um, to get started with. Of course, uh, uh, though automotive is a good start, right? Even healthcare, okay. But I think to to see the immediate uh, results that could uh, contribute to the sustainable development goals, I think uh, smart city is actually a, a very um, perfect use case, right? For uh, highly populated um, countries. So a number of enablers have been there, okay, uh, to enable the rise of IoT. So we have seen that the census price have dropped uh, in the last few decades, right? Um, bandwidth are cheaper today, okay? Uh, processing them is actually much uh, declined because the cost has been declined. Uh, a lot of devices not to be just connected, but they are smart enough to know what to do with all the new data they are generating or receiving, right? And um, we have smartphones uh, as our personal gateway to the IoT. So, um, Today, we can just use our handphones or smartphones as a dashboard, as a remote control or hub for, you know, for connecting our home or the car, uh, for fitness tracking, right? And uh, a lot of consumers or users are actually started to wear. And we have ubiquitous wireless coverage with the Wi-Fi hotspots everywhere, even in the shopping malls, right? Um, sometimes available for free at very low cost. Given uh, Wi-Fi utilizes, you know, unlicensed uh, spectrum. And uh, not to forget about the big data, uh, as the IoT will be, uh, by definition, generate the voluminous amounts of unstructured data. The availability of big data analytics is a key enabler, right? So I think um, we need IoT as a feeder to the big data, right? So um, without data, the big data can't um, analyze or do uh, bring to the next um, steps. So IoT would be a, an enabler for this big data and analytics. Then the IPv6, they're addressing. I think most networking equipment today supports IPv6, so not an issue for us uh, to get started. Um, and this uh, IPv6 actually intended to replace the IPv4 in contrast, and it supports one to eight bit of address, so almost limited numbers, right? So sometimes it looks very um, um, uh, futuristic that we are talking about billions of devices, you know, by 2020. And if you look at the Cisco's notion, they, they always stress this, uh, billions of devices by 2020. So of course we are not there yet, but it's just a projection, a trajectory, saying that IoT is growing. It's going to be scalable, right? So um, heterogeneous interconnected objects, right, for IoT, we are going to see rapid and real transactions. Uh, but again, we have to remind ourselves the real philosophy of IoT is not in the connectivity, but the services that we provide out of it. So uh, generally, right, uh, every researchers are very much um, um, inclined towards the connectivity, but I think it's a uh, high time for us to look into the, the services, right, that we can provide. So I think the vision is that uh, probably a day, there'll be a day that we just need to open our browser to locate our missing um, devices, right? So what IoT is trying to do is actually to connect the non-physical uh, um, uh, era to the physical um, world, right? So it's all about a cyber physical system. We are, we, are, we are seeing the very thin gap between the physical world and the cyber, cyber world. And IoT has become a very important enabler in narrowing the gap between this cyber world and the physical world. So I think the, uh, if you look at the recent trend, right? Um, there's been a surge of uh, interest into big data, right? And of course, uh, machine learning has been there, right? Uh, quite stable, gradual um, growth. But IoT has been always uh, 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 associated steadily with these other uh, domains like machine learning and big data because they are interdependent each other, right? So uh, it's not a standalone um, uh, core technology, but it's interdependent with big data and machine learning. Right. So big data is the carries 90% of the data actually um, was created by big data alone, right? 
and we have devices like uh, mobile devices, smartphones, okay, that uh, that exceeds one billion plus since two thousand thirteen, and um, a lot of um, customers actually depends on the social site for purchasing devices. If there's no more catalogs or um, you know printed materials, it's all about reviews that we they read online. It all the reviews based on the social media sites, right? So eighty percent of decision making uh, are based on the social sites. And sixty-two uh, percent of the uh, workloads are uh, shared by the cloud, right? And uh, as I mentioned earlier, fifty billion devices to be connected by internet by twenty twenty. Of course, um, we haven't reached that figure yet. With just a prediction, and we are talking about the API economy. Well, uh, global and commercial sales were eighty-five billion, right? So uh, there was a, a prediction uh, done by Gartner. From the year two thousand thirteen to eighteen, uh, but since um, we, when we are um, impacted with this uh, COVID nineteen, there was a three hundred sixty uh, paradigm shift into this API economy. Uh, we have seen a small medium enterprises, um, small scale businesses shifting gradually to online platforms, right? Uh, as a matter of you know um, survival. And uh, this has been contributing to 360 de degree of uh, transformation of the API economy, right? So a lot of challenges is there, right? Um, technical challenges, right? Business challenges, um, uh, even societal, right? Um, for academics, I think um, it's very, uh, um, I would say, a very good leverage to solve the technical challenges. Okay, in terms of um, devices, and the hardware. Right. Um, I think if you are thinking about using um, FPGA or system on chip, okay, um, uh, probably you want to use uh, ASIC application specific integrated chip to develop your uh, IoT devices. Um, the protocols that you use for communication, so Wi Fi, LoRa, right? Uh, even the software platform, okay, if you have uh, your own framework, um, if you're talking about Laravel, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, simplified programming like Python, uh, even C. Uh, there are there are many technical challenges that could be solved, right? And of course, it has to be matched with the business um, um, application domains. How do you turn up the revenue challenge per device, per connectivity? Like telcos, they are mostly interested on billing, right? So there, there is one reason why IoT has been very late uh, to be captured by the telcos, right? Because there's uh, um, um, some issues on uh, billing mechanism, right? So um, currently, I think most of the IoT protocols are based on Wi-Fi and um, uh, radio net RF and uh, like Bluetooth and so on. But there's someone, there's one thing called narrowband IoT and IoT, and this is what the telcos are interested in because the narrowband is actually based on the cellular technology, and this is a, a very good options for them for building, right? So hope it's not going to be a new new business model <laughs> again for you know, for for the consumers or otherwise the consumer will suffer. Okay. Uh, you don't want to build the IoT services, actually. Right? Um, the societal challenge is always there, like privacy, ownership challenge, security challenge. Okay, the ease of, easiness of users challenge. How do you cooperate socially, right? Uh, among these three challenges, all right. Of course, there are some uh, impact on the regulations by the government, but the most difficult challenge is actually the uh, societal, right? Uh, how do you ensure the privacy are met? How do you ensure this? There is ownership and so on. So when we talk about this, it's all point to the uh, fourth industrial revolutions. Um, I think from the steam engine, mass production, internet technology, and today we are the internet of things, right? So um, a match shift, major shift is happening actually in silent, right? <clears throat> and uh, if you look at today's um, revolutions, um, uh, the cyber physical system, right? Uh, taking over the industrial revolutions um, from IT, and also autonomous productions, uh, fully based on um, uh, Internet of Things and big data and machine learning. And there seems to be a lot of level of complexity in that. So the level of complexity in the industrial revolution today is actually increasing. Okay, Though um, the migration of this um, industry scenario is happening, but uh, due to the level of complexity, it's not that easy. And uh, there are many aspects that need to be taken care of. Right? So I think uh, just to quick glance, uh, what's happening today? Uh, we have come from the era of uh, short message service, right? 
then uh, we have moved to uh, World Wide Web with the emails, okay, informations, um, you know, um, streaming contents, and then we had this um, e-commerce, and then we moved to social media, right, um, quite actively, and today we expect there would be some machine-to-machine -machine, um, kind of applications that doesn't involve human, right? So something like identifications, uh, tracking, uh, monitoring, or even metering, okay, getting data from your utility, and, uh, and how do you um, semantically structure those data and share them, right, uh, in an interoperable manner. And this could be the uh, potential research problem for us, right? A highly um, potential research problem for researchers or even for industry practitioners, right? So 50 billion connected objects by 2020. This is predicted by Cisco, right? So uh, a lot of white papers will actually always coin um, or refer to the Cisco white paper uh, on the scalability, right? So the the notion that Cisco projections is based on the network devices. They are not based on the applications. Today, we, we know that we have these network devices, but we have very less workable IoT applications. So that is our focus should be, all right? So how do we go about uh, solid working, workable IoT applications that could actually benefit the users and the consumers? So the industry is hyping. Uh, they are saying that there will be billions of devices uh, predicted. But we have to know the essential elements, what kind of applications that we want to build, or what kind of research areas that you want to get involved for IoT. And uh, why would a consumer want the device? And how does it connect to the world, right? And the uh, most important question is, where is the intelligence, right? And can we trust the devices? Is there any trustworthiness aspect being considered for that? So these are the elements of that we have to um, consider in designing an IoT ecosystem, right? So uh, I'll give you an example. This is a very clear example. Okay, uh, what you're seeing here is actually a traditional racket, uh, the racket that you use to play badminton, or even tennis, right? So, and on the um, right side is actually the um, IoT-enabled racket, right? The difference between these two rackets is that uh, the IoT-enabled racket has um, six hours of battery life, and it is coupled with many uh, built-in sensors. So those sensors are like accelerometers to monitor your acceleration, a motion sensor, um, sweat sensor to check your sweat, right? Um, pulse sensor, okay, many more sensors, right? And you can just name it. And it has a built-in gyroscope, right? Um, and a um, few processors that actually uh, connects to the cloud and sending the data in real time, right? So the question is that, how do you make a sense of the data that is being generated by the IoT enabled record? Okay, is there any um, uh, flexibility or uh, necessity for us to have many sensors in such record? Are we going to monitor the player's performance? Or are we going to monitor or are we going to do a strategy predictions of the games? So how do you choose the right sensor? How do you make sure that um, such use case would be beneficial for IoT ecosystem. I think it's very important for us to understand uh, by just making a connecting object uh, would not do much uh, benefit. I think even though when you transform a typical uh, classical uh, racket to IoT enabled racket, there should be a very clear use case that could benefit the, uh, the consumers in general. So there are also high level you know, um, works being done um, for example, for instance, in Washington State University, they have this um, uh, IoT that uses to uh, via bridge to bridge interface. They are using uh, Internet of Things. Uh, a person's brain can send signal to other brain. Okay, so this is extended from uh, the um, uh, EEG um, research. Uh, we call it a brain computing interface (BCI). And they are useful for handicapped people to communicate to others. Right? These are some of the uh, work being done, but they are not being commercialized it's on the on the research level. And uh, I think it's very fair for us to understand about wearable devices. Uh, wearable devices has been always underestimated, right? Uh, I think if you look at the uh, surrounding, most of the time the wearable devices are used for health and fitness tracking. Okay, and um, 
uh, indeed, uh, I would say in coming years, we would, we would see that wearable device would be a major um, shift for IoT uh, related projects. And a lot of new IoT uh, innovations are based, will be based on wearables. So uh, some of the recent IoT products, right? Um, like this Nest thermostats, um, Coventis wireless uh, cardiac monitor, uh, Vimo remote, pet trackers, uh, things work, ninja blocks, um, MBAT, right? And uh, all these products are surprisingly by startups. They are not by tech giants. And what happened is that once these, these products are developed by startups, then they are brought over by tech giants. For instance, the Nest thermostats uh, was brought over by um, Google, right? So a lot of uh, fresh ideas comes from the uh, startup and actually the fresh graduates who actually develop this uh, IoT products. So um, connecting things, okay, though it's very important for, for us to realize uh, the importance of um, having an IoT um, objects, but I think the most important thing is that making uh, the data generated by the IoT, uh, making sense out of it, right? How do you, how do, you do classifications? How do you run a prediction test? How do you measure the latency and so on? Okay. So for anyone who wants to get started, right, uh, in IoT projects, okay, I think they, uh, there are a few components. There are five key components that we have to, um, you know, um, understand. Um, so these five components is actually um, <clears throat> started with the power uh, and storage management. Uh, security and privacy, um, and then we have this uh, microcontrollers, okay, uh, sensors and actuators, and then connectivity. So these are the five essential key components that we have to consider in developing or getting started with any IoT projects. So let us see, all right? So power and storage management. So um, 50 billion IoT devices by 2020, as predicted by Cisco Systems, right? So we know that IoT devices does not consume much power because normally it's milliwatts, you know? Um, and we are talking, when you talk about sensors, it's merely five volts, right? But why there'll be a staggering demand for power is because we are talking about voluminous of those, those devices. We are not dealing with one or two sensors, but we might deal with thousand sensors or 10,000 sensors. And um, let's say, for instance, you are deploying um, uh, vibration sensors on the bridge. So structural monitoring definitely would need uh, a span of 1,000 to 2,000 sensors scattered around the bridge. And definitely, there will be a staggering demand for power. And this is where we could actually leverage on ultra-low power designs, uh, like such as thin film energy storage, or even energy harvesting. And I would say solar or PV, right? Photovoltaic uh, solar energy or renewable energy would be an ideal uh, uh, option for low power designs for IoT devices. Okay, uh, this is a one area that we have to look into deep, deeply. Right? And apart from that, uh, apart from power, you have this storage management. Okay, one could argue that we have these cloud platforms that could actually aggregate those data, but we have to remember that. Many of our personalized IoT devices are dealing with vital data, okay, a sensitive or personalized data that could not be aggregated in public cloud. Definitely user would expect <clears throat> some local uh, mechanism, local data storing mechanism, uh, something like a content aggregator so that you can actually log files um, from the sensors that could scale up and you could store it locally. So this is an important option as well. So both uh, for power and storage, I think uh, this could be an important consideration for IoT devices. I think a lot of research work, a problem statement lies on leveraging the low power designs and how do you use uh, renewable energy uh, to cater the need for uh, power and storage management for IoT devices. Um, the second component, security and privacy. Okay. Uh, there is a rapid transformation in how we deal with information. I think, as we know, the security and privacy is a never ending story, right? Uh, no matter whatever whatever field that you're working on, uh, even when you file for patent, when you when you file for you know, um, 
uh, copyright uh, when you present to the industry the first question would be how secure is your device okay this is, this is a very common question right so we know that iot characterize data intensive environment um, the heterogeneous consumer iot devices generate massive data most of the time is personalized and very much very much vital so definitely there is a need for effective data protections that needed to prevent um, confidential information falling into wrong hands right and uh, users like us will only accept iot devices that are highly secure uh, privacy preserved and there should be some trustworthiness index associated with that with it otherwise so we can't much we can't do much on that right so um this is a scenario that happens in the black hat conference okay uh, black hat is actually an annual gathering by uh, security researchers and hackers so they did a demo on the uh, you know um, hacking a connected toilet making it flush instantly and closing the lid repeatedly and unexpectedly so uh, imagine that we have connected devices around us and there could be some sort of sabotage you know um, of those devices uh, um, by the hackers so we don't want this to happen especially when you have thousand devices around us and then all of them are working uh, rapidly right so there should be definitely a very strong point for us to embark on the need for uh, strong security and privacy uh, the, the third, third component is actually the microcontrollers right uh, mcus has been always an important okay to sustain the expansion of the uh, uh, consumer centric iot they bring much needed intelligence to the um, uh, consumer centric iot devices and they delivers uh, meaningful predictive analytics and data reductions and most of the time they expand the consumer centric iot so many people never never thought that uh, mcus could become a enabler right so um, in the last 15 years uh, advanced boards like fpga soc was actually the main mainstream but when arduino raspberry pi came into the scene okay uh, the 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 scene the entire scene shifted right it transformed and then many didn't never expect that uh, such low cost devices could actually accelerate um, the um, uh, horizon of the uh, iot devices right? so uh, very commonly used um, uh, mcus for iot smart objects are like arduino um, pi raspberry pi okay then you have this um, from intel uh, galileo and then um, legal bone i think this is quite um, cheaply available online right i think one one can just uh, order online and then can get you get you started right so um, many of btech i think btech students or even mtech students could just you know uh, get started with just some simple projects on iot uh, by putting up a couple of sensors and playing with these bots right and um, and to learn this uh, programming is it's not a great deal i think uh, everybody could just do it right uh, and like already know is based on simple c based on the processing language and um the pi based on uh, python right so grabbing this to uh, domain knowledge is good for students to get started with these projects uh, apart from that we have some bespoke iot but these are more advanced level uh, just like the um uh, photon boards link it um Edison from Intel, KTI bots, Texas Instruments, and th this could be um, like more, be more much powerful and uh, uh, depends on the application specific that you are actually dealing with, right? And if you're if you're dealing with a lot of data, then you might need some better high speed processing board for that. And the uh, fourth component, right, uh, is about the sensors and actuators, right? So detect. Sensors are used to detect, gather, and measure data based on inputs, and then upon the data. So, very vital component for IoT ecosystem. And um, much of these sensors provides location-based services, GPS, temperature, vital sign sensor, okay, like pulse rate, blood glucose monitoring, especially in healthcare. And most of the time, they are needed for actuation and prescriptive actions, right? So, sens sensors today are also like um, you know um, they're massive, they're huge. And they are fit. Uh, they're very cheap, and you you could get it online, right? So accelerations, okay, um, force sensors, flow sensors, chemical sensors, temperatures, right? So these kind of sensors are available in the market, okay? And one can just just choose a few couple of sensors that related to your domain knowledge, 
and start working on the uh, projects, right? So uh, things are much better today. I think um, because we have the flexibility to choose our sensors, right? Um, and there is no calibration needed unless you are going for industrial grade sensors. But uh, for IoT projects, I think a good start would be um, offering a project to the B Tech students or even M Tech students to come up with a use case. And uh, once you have the use case, then you, you could start up with a raw prototype. From the raw prototype, that it can be a full-fledged uh, research prototype. Okay, so there are three phases involved, which I will share with you in the coming modules. So the fourth component, right? Um, sorry, the fifth component is actually the connectivity. Uh, IoT crosses a broad range of data rates, right? Uh, many times, okay, we actually uh, embarked on Wi-Fi being the strongest um, contender, okay, for IoT. Uh, one thing is that for an Internet of Things connectivity is that you need to leverage on many communication technologies that, that we always on experiencing. At the same time, we have to minimize the power consumption, right? And there is a new player in the in the market it's called as Bluetooth for low energy. We call as BLE. Although Bluetooth is an, it's not a um, new technology, it's been there, but the revised uh, standard for Bluetooth we, they call as BLE 5.0. Uh, it seems to be a very strong contender for Wi-Fi due to the uh, minimal power consumptions, right? And uh, a lot of uh, tech industries are actually shifting to BLE, Bluetooth for low energy, uh, for the purpose of location-based services, right? So one example is like the um, IKEA, okay, the, uh, the manufacturing icon. Uh, they are, they are deploying Bluetooth for their cataloging system through um, apps, right? So this is one uh, potential, right? So apart from Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you we do have a, a lot of options, right? And uh, many of the uh, different uh, protocols developed by different consortiums, right? So of course, uh, when we are new, I think we are, we are normally carried away. I mean, uh, how, do we, how do we narrow down which protocol to get started, right? So I think every a new, a simple IoT project, you should, should just start with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and then slowly to be tested with other protocols like LoRa or even Sigfox. And these are all the um, large range, right? long, uh, long distance range kind of protocols that could be applicable in smart city scenarios and so on. So to learn this, each protocol, I think uh, uh, we just need to be straightforward. We just need to identify what are the proper connectivity that is could be suitable for use case. So uh, looking at the architecture, it's very important to others to understand, right? Um, what happened is that from the uh, uh, three layer architecture, we have gone through the middle way base. From the middle way, we become to service oriented architecture. And today we have this uh, five layer architecture. So IoT actually across, cut across these um, uh, layers and uh, at the top, you normally have this business layer or the application layer, and then you should have the service management. And very important to have the uh, object abstraction, okay? Uh, something like uh, translating the objects, okay? And then uh, at, the, at the bottom is your uh, raw objects or the hardware, okay? So the real problem is actually, how do you differentiate objects from different manufacturers? I, I'll, have an, I'll give you an example. If I have an air condition from um, Samsung and um, I want the data from the air condition provided by the Samsung to talk to my um, front main door uh, designed by Bosch, okay, a German company. So you have a Korean company and a German company. So how do you, how do you ensure that you should, there could be some interoperation happen? Okay, this is a real problem actually. So many of these devices, they don't talk to each other, right? But of course, when you want to realize an IoT ecosystem, you want all those sensors and devices to exchange data mutually without human intervention and in a very uh, applicable manner with a low latency. So a lot of uh, problems actually, how do you make those devices to talk to each other in a federated manner? So this is the real concern about interoperability in IoT. Right, so interoperability is all about uh, having two or more devices to exchange message and to perform the functions in a federated manner. So IoT architecture, right? They cut across uh, many layers. 
uh, starting from the sensing layer where you have many different devices that comes with different um, uh, functionality. Then you have these network infrastructures, right? Um, like uh, wide, uh, wide area network, okay, large scale internet. And then uh, much of our work actually focus on information processing on the data center, search engine, decision making, okay, information security, data mining. How do you classify those data, right? Uh, what kind of algorithms that we use? And then uh, finally, you have to integrate those um, uh, processed information to this real application, right? So many layers are involved and we could have many different research areas in this layer and then they could be integrated into one. Okay. So many times, um, you, when you read a read white paper, all right, okay, or you will see an example that says IoT is a very good uh, use case for smart homes, right? Of course, uh, when IoT started in 1988, the first use case actually was discussed is about smart home. But I like to stress here that uh, smart home is, is might not be an ideal use case for a country like India, even in Singapore, even Malaysia, right? Because um, uh, smart home is actually a use case that is actually very suitable for Western agenda, right? So uh, whenever you, you choose a use case, it has to be correctly aligned with the local social context. Right, so um, I think in in uh, countries like Malaysia, even India, we we don't really have uh, um, uh, preferences for gadgets in the home, but we 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 like to see more improvement on the on the um, public infrastructure, right? So uh, and this is also important for academics to know um, the right use cases. But to get started as a as a mini project or even a B tech project, I think a smart home would be a very um, good um, Place to start. Okay, just just for uh, uh, you know an opening use case, something like that, right? Right. So um, okay, this is a libellium, right? Um, it's a, they are actually a product pro, pro, uh, provider, sensor providers, and uh, board providers for um, uh, IoT projects. Uh, they have a very interesting um, uh, infographics that actually um, you know uh, most of the uh, use cases are out of the box, like air pollution. Right, um, sportsman care, structural health modeling, waste management, water quality, water leakages, and um, this infographics tells us that many of these uh, projects are actually uh, socially uh, aligned. So it's very important for us to to come up with this kind of uh, use cases. So Libelium, I think the infographic could be a good starting point for any new budding researchers or even um, postgraduate students who wants to get started. Uh, getting involved in IoT ecosystem. Right? Okay, I think um, um, we'll, we'll take a short uh, break, right? So I just have something uh, just to inst instigate something, you know, uh, for brainstorming our discussion today. Uh, probably uh, the audience, you know, can tell me some important use cases for IoT that could be capitalized for post COVID nineteen era. Right? I think we we are in a very challenging period now. Uh, the lockdown is, you know, um, uh, is coming, and then um, suddenly the lockdown is lifted, and then the lockdown is coming back. So, so there are a lot of disruptions in our daily um, lifestyle and living, and um, and the way we uh, work, the way we uh, teach, the way we uh, communicate socially, right? Everything changes. So, how do you, how do we see um, IoT as enabler? That could be capitalized for post uh, COVID nineteen era. So just an open discussion, um, nothing to wait. All right. So probably we can take a break. Uh, is it okay, Doctor Amin? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So probably it means uh, those who would like to say something about this particular question, they can raise their hand. Sure. Okay. Then probably we will take up them one by one. Or meanwhile, sir, maybe you can take a break. No issue, sir. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So, yes. Anyone who would like to suggest something for this? Who we? Um, yeah. Yes, I think there is a one. Uh, okay, Mudit, you can unmute your mic and you can speak. Yes, Mudit. 
Hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Sir, uh, sir uh, I wanted to share my uh, share my application that uh, when we are studying this uh, training on IoT, uh, Amit sir shares uh, the assignments and modules on on a website platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we could automate that uh, process uh, so that when the teaching stops, the content gets automatically updated on on our uh, on our computers and mobile devices so that we can look on it and uh, human human intervention is uh, redu reduced reduced okay uh, this is good because um, i think this is a very common uh, problem that we face so when you have um, a mechanism to automate your content so that that's something uh, very applicable i think that's good i think you have you have been implementing that right not uh, currently, sir. It is automated, but uh, maybe we can think about, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That, that's good use case actually. Okay. Yes. Any other? Uh, we can have like temperature sensors which can get connected to a central server to see like how many people are ill or not ill and. Uh, Depending on that, see what is the risk of a certain area in a certain city. Okay. Uh, yeah, that that's a good one. Uh, this has been uh, quite similar with what we call as uh, uh, occupancy detection, right? Uh, you know, in large large areas like railway station, uh, when you have people, you know, a large number of people moving um, around. Uh, you could have that kind of uh, uh, applications, but uh, there must be a, a clear functional objective. Uh, what do we want? What kind of data do you want to measure? Uh, are you just collecting the temperature for some predictions, or you want to control the temperature around, or probably you want to see the heat? Um, you know, like you know, like today, I think in the COVID-19, uh, we are concerned about anyone beyond uh, 37. Um, it's barred. You know, entering at some restricted area. Uh, so there should be some clear functional objectives when we uh, do such a picture. So that's a good one. Okay. So thanks for yeah, sharing. Like, uh, we can uh, assess the risk of a certain area saying like, uh, okay, even like we are getting a large quantity of high temperature people uh, around this area. So mm -hmm. we need to shut down this uh, central gathering area or central railway station or something like that so that we can curb the, you know, spread of the disease or like it can be used to assess the risk is what exactly, I was exactly exactly you, you could do that right. So uh, there, there are many ways to do that actually. Uh, yeah. You are not only the your occupancy occupancy sensors or the temperature sensor, but we need some zoning. Uh, zoning means that you you cluster the area, um, the large yeah. area into different clusters, and then we work on the clusters. That could be done. Okay. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Anirudha. Uh, I, I think another one, Bridul. Bridul, I think you have raised your hand. Please speak. Hello, sir. Hello, Bridul. Sir, we can utilize IoT and uh, capitalize on it uh, by using uh, it for uh, attendance measures like when we go into the university, earlier we used our hands. So uh, instead of it, it could measure or it could identify us using retina scans or biometric data so that uh, there is no human contact there. It is already being used in many places and could be further utilized for access to many platforms like at uh, railway stations and something like that. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good one. So you saw all about the contactless application. Yes. Yeah, that's the right one. I think the right. Uh, terminology would be as you mentioned it's a uh, contactless so, uh, it's a good one uh, i think we can actually look forward for that yes so if you have su such idea i think uh, this is the right time to apply for funding you know uh, a lot if you look at a lot of the funding uh, international funding uh, they have shifted to this kind of uh, post covid 19 uh, objectives so such idea, I think, even though the idea might be uh, uh, very infant, uh, may need more information to be developed. I think you can just start writing uh, a small proposal and then, um, you know, getting started for apply for the money. I think you should be able to get it. Okay. Uh, 
sir actually we have two more uh, one uh, suggestion i think from they have maybe we can hear them uh, yeah. yes ankita you can unmute your mic and you can speak yes ankita uh, yes yes sir uh, sir uh, we can implement iot for distribution of essentials also uh, like uh, like people don't have to go out for buying necessary things like they, uh, like their demands can be uh like that their de demands and that supply that that they they, uh, they can be monitored over some network and uh, we can uh, supply those goods according to the demand so that they don't have to go out uh, more often yep like, yep that's good that's uh, something that everybody is looking forward actually yeah uh, so you are you you preserving the demand but using the technology actually yeah. so uh, limiting the mobility of the uh, um user but at the same yeah. time the uh, the made goods or groceries are actually delivered to the to them yeah in a, in a timely manner so uh, that's good that's good. Uh, that's uh, uh, so a lot of things can be done i mean the first thing is actually the data uh, the type of data that you get uh, the grocery data uh, the requirement of the uh, users and uh, the medicines. way yeah medicines right and, um, yeah. and it it could scale up actually you could scale up once you start mm -hmm. i think it could scale up so that that's good one Okay. Right. I think Thanks. the final final one, sir. I think the last one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. GPS GV. Maybe you can speak uh, about. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, uh, usually, when the lockdown is lifted and again it is being imposed on, um, in countries like India, uh, in our state, actually, if they go, uh, if they have announced the lockdown, means the day before everyone goes for the groceries, uh, farmers market like that, if they go, so um, we can give um, a predictive analysis like that. At least, uh, however, this much people means up to the. Uh, Uh, up to these people, we can allow uh, like that. One uh, hundred people means that hundred people only should be there in the market, and it should be uh, the live field should be updated on uh, on the server who is monitoring the uh, whole uh, town, town market area. Like that, if it would mean that the social uh, distancing and uh, many more factors can be achieved. Even though our humans, we can't uh, do always at all time. Uh, machines will made us tame to be like that. Okay, that, that, uh, that's quite applicable, I think. Uh, but I think uh, such project we we can't do it alone. I think we need the help of the local council. Yeah, um, uh, uh, it's a very big, it's a very big proposal has to be made. It's a social motto actually. That's it. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's good. I think uh, this happens in I think in every country that when the lockdown is announced, there is a panic buying uh, happening a day before. Uh, so everybody is rushing to the market, groceries, you know, and then uh, there'll be a lot of contacts, um, you know, um, and that could be one factor of the virus spread because when you have a lot of people uh, one, uh, put, uh, rushing into the stores a day before the lockdown, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, we uh, I think we can move ahead now, sir. Okay. Okay. Sure. I'll just go ahead. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Um. So you can see the slide. Okay. I think. Um. I've 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 put there uh, three important cases, but based on the discussion that we uh, had just now, I think everybody moreover talks about the same answers that I am displaying now. Right? It's about the contactless uh, application for society, uh, like social distancing alert, and then I also heard some answers on the telemedicine, right? On um, um, even crowd control, uh, getting groceries, uh, medicines um, uh, using IoT. So uh, just name it. I think the the the, the list goes on, but uh, we we need to we need to tune such use cases uh, slightly creative, and then uh, this could be a very good um, um, project. Okay, uh, ready for research or even for a real case deployment. Right. So can can you see the slide changes? Is it okay, Doctor Me? Yes, sir. We can see. 
we okay, are okay. at iot technology page yes okay okay thank you okay so uh, moving on all right on iot technologies i think uh, we have seen a little bit on the mcus the microcontrollers the hardware device okay the communication technology some protocols the software the id and the cloud platforms i think uh, apart from the most important thing i think um, and the most difficult not to say difficult i mean we have a, a like a um, uh, multiple users right multiple protocols that has been has been there for iot uh, like co app constraint application protocol uh, message queue telemetry and xmpp six low pan right so sometimes students will uh, ask which protocols that we have to use sir so i i i would say that uh, the protocols is not an issue i think the issue is that uh, whether the protocol can cater the data the type of data that you going to extract so that that is more important so uh, requirement analysis for the data types is important before we decide on the type of the protocol to be used right so this is a huge uh, area but i will discuss this in the coming modules so uh, for iot right uh, there are there the when when you have a data uh, definitely there is need for cloud um, because cloud is actually um, a service model that they needed for sensing uh, when you have sensors uh, generating those data and those data need to be published and then they should be uh, sent to the extended service providers and then finally to the uh, data consumers so a lot of cloud technologies there today and um, sometimes the the uh, the golden questions from the student is that uh, what programming language i should embark on okay to get started with uh, my iot right so basically generally they are all the programming languages uh, supports the iot ecosystem uh, mainly c sharp c++ okay or basic c then you have this node js um Uh, java uh, and even python that is uh, quite convenient because not only as a uh, firmware programming but you also helps for you for data analytics right so learning python and then you using python hybrid with other like programming language would be really beneficial so um, a little bit about arduino okay i think tomorrow uh, we will see about arduino about um, how to start with arduino programming um arduino is actually uh, the uses a simple c it is it, it's, it's not a full uh, c syntax but it's like based on the processing.org and um uh, the programming uh, modes are very quite straight forward for arduino i think uh, it will just take few lines for you to get started uh, with this arduino thing and uh, in recent years it's become very stable uh, due to the large uh, acceptance by the open source community right and uh, if you you'll be surprised that countries like japan uh, they are using arduino and raspberry pi for their industrial uh, uh, operations right because uh, everybody is now today is looking into the cost cutting so they are looking for cheaper resources and then uh, very surprising that some factories or plants in japan are using arduino and raspberry pi for their uh, operations right just for like collecting data uh, like scanning the machine uh, health diagnostics and so on so getting started with the uh, uh, cloud for iot okay you have a lot of options uh more, uh, most of the uh, tech giants have their own platforms uh, google has their own cloud microsoft they have the azure amazon is uh, charging a good price for their aws you know um, amazon web service ibm with their blue mix and then you have the samsung with the arctic cloud and you have an open source uh, cloud platform called thingspeak but uh with very limited uh features unless you have a full subscriptions right thingspeak is free to try but you you'll face a lot of delay when you want to see your data on the dashboard so amazon aws has you know, has been very stable till today because of the uh, core components right uh amazon actually provides the uh, device sdk so it's like uh regardless of the hardware that we use um there will be set of client libraries given to us uh, to authenticate and connect and sending the messages uh they have a very clear uh, security layer uh they have a, with the mutual authentication and encryption and then um and how to perform the message exchange to the device gateway 
So using MQTT and other WebSockets. So uh, one good advantage of this kind of um, Amazon AWS is that they have this rules engine, right? Um, so rules is like a conditions. So when you have uh, messages and these messages are actually uh, transform into the rule base and they'll be routed to the uh, Amazon Web Services, right? So, um, so it has a built-in rules uh, engine, right? So, um, being a being in computing um, a computer science domain, right, normally uh, we have many options, right? Uh, for instance, to use deep learning, um, probably to use data mining, uh, different classification methods, but based on the clear objectives. But uh, many of the existing IoT projects today in industry are still based on the rule-based uh, systems, RBS, uh, because most of the IoT devices out there is just plain uh, on and off. They just need a simple uh, rule-based system that actually could be executed in a fast manner with lower latency. So there is no need for them to have, a, you know, um, GPUs to train, to, to learn. Um, all they need is just to turn on and off. So uh, pretty straightforward, uh, though it looks very classical, but uh, this is what's happening in the industry. I think many, till today, many of the building facility managers that actually uh, uses IoT devices, they are still, um, retaining their rule-based systems, right? And they haven't migrated to uh, advanced algorithms like um, uh, deep learning and so on, right? But in research area, we, we are, of course, looking at into other uh, advanced algorithms, but uh, I'm just giving a comparison what's happening in the real world and what's happening in the research community. There is a, there is a clear gap um, that we are not addressing yet. So Samsung Arctic and IBM Watson uh, IoT, these those platforms are quite similar, okay? They have the uh, uh, APIs, all right, uh, sockets, and um, you know, like um, uh, they have this um, um, MQTT protocols as well, okay? So uh, this is what happens when you have the MCUs uh, connected to the cloud, and uh, there'll be a layer called field gateway uh, from the field gateway, you have the cloud protocol cafe and then uh, the interact with the IoT hub. So a lot of data has been uh, going through those gateways, right? Uh, but if you're developing a small scale applications, uh, there is no need for you to have a gateway. But if you're taking, talking about uh, taking data from different sectors, data centers, then uh, cloud protocol cafe is a necessity to have. Okay, dashboard, I think, um, it's very important um, component, right? When you develop um, uh, IoT projects, okay, IoT products, uh, the dashboard normally will determine the the complexity, okay, or the uh, the full fledged functions of your IoT devices. Okay, uh, the dashboard tells us how do you manage those devices, um, what type of access that we could provide. Uh, type of data logging, what type of data they can be displayed, and can we create some rules or actions, right? Um, and how do you visually present the data, right? So uh, if you look at the um, many of the data analysts or even data scientists, they, they spend more time in designing this uh, dashboard functionality. They don't look into the core projects, but they will normally uh, spend more time on the dashboard functionality because this is what uh, the user wants, especially on the industry side, they want to see a, um, I would say a fancy, uh, very interesting uh, dashboard that could actually have all the widgets uh, that tells you exactly what's happening in the system, right? So never underestimate the importance of dashboard functionality. I think 40% uh, of the time, of the project time should be allocated to the dashboard functionality uh, because, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a social um, norm that we humans are very attracted to the visual uh, data, right? So uh, the way we present visually on the, on the dashboard uh, is critical in order to ensure that the projects uh, is successful. So a uh, lot of projects uh, taking place worldwide. And um, I think one good example in the education sector, uh, this is in Australia, right, in New South Wales. Uh, they have been using the IoT to make uh, facility management more efficient. Uh, what happens is that by placing sensor on trash bin, they to indicate the fill level, 
uh, and they also use the video surveillance to identify the common areas that need cleaning. Uh, the system can ensure the facility maintenance resources are deployed as needed. So when they bring this data online, uh, the university's facility management can you know, collect the, those data and allocate the resource accordingly. So this one um, initiative of using IoT to make uh, facility management more efficient, right? So it looks very simple that they put us some sensors on the trash bin just to see the level, right? And then based on the data, they actually trigger the, you know, the collections, uh, cleaning facilities and other things that need to be done, right? Uh, financial service like banking, right? Also have started to use IoT. So what happens is that today, uh, performing physical and virtual security assessment of numerous facilities deemed sensitive by the bank, okay? So like you, you can't go physically and test the, you know, um, uh, security assessment. So uh, banks, uh, they feel that they could better connect it in internal of everything. So that like uh, they can expose uh, if there is any network vulnerability uh, by part, and then these tripling the cost to attacks, attackers of the infecting the network. So uh, a lot of banks actually have these um, IoT systems that actually uh, scans uh, and perform a security assessment, a security audit uh, without human, right? So they leave it to the machine. It, it sounds dangerous. It's like a, uh, something that we watch in movies, but um, this is happening actually in most of the banking sectors. I think... Uh, this is in Delhi, in India. So they have uh, partnered with Cisco. Uh, they have an intelligent IP network that supports day-to-day -day operations. So uh, by connecting its retail management system to CCTV, the dial system, gain location-based mapping capability to gather the data. So uh, this is our already there, right? Um, in Delhi Airport. Supply chain management, right? Um, Normally, it's a very uh, common use case. When units are supplied with RFID tags, a system on site can count them. Uh, so when the count drops below a given level, the system can trigger a request from central order to be order more. The idle time goes down and projects have better chances of being completed on time. Right? So normally, this happens in construction areas. Okay, utility, I think, um, uh, why are the IoT sites can send back information uh, on the amount of their electrical consumptions and, and they could calculate uh, the amount of consumption. So everything is in the analytics cloud. So uh, this is one clear project on smart grid. Uh, and this is one interesting project in Australia as well. Uh, what happens is that they have used IoT together with augmented reality, right? So what you see here is actually a safety helmet used in constructions. So this helmet has the uh, operational instructions and navigational and driving information that come over IoT in real time. So it's like loaded uh, in real time. And that task can be overlaid onto the real world view of the job to be done or the journey to be traveled. So when the wearer wears the helmet, he could see uh, the mapping, uh, the driving information or the safety information or uh, the risk analysis, all right, uh, throughout the day while you wear the helmet. So this is like um, hybrid that you use IoT with augmented reality, something that very uh, good to to safeguard the welfare of the workers. Uh, building information modeling, right? Uh, this is one a good example how computer models have been used to direct real life uh, constructions that can then in build updated by IoT sensors placed in buildings that have been constructed. Uh, the sensors can send back information on the way that materials are affected by changing climates and the passage of time. So I think many bridges, we have uh, ancient buildings, uh, ancient bridges that can be protected, the national heritage uh, facilities or infrastructure uh, by using these IoT sensors because they could collect um, data, right? Um, from time to time. So I could uh, specify one example. I think in uh, December 2004, we had this um, tsunami in Asia. So during the tsunami, there was an earthquake uh, uh, in Indonesia, and uh, we could actually felt the tremor in Malaysia. So in Malaysia, we have a national bridge called Penang Bridge. So we had the tremor. Uh, so because this is a national infrastructure, so we have been directed to install a vibration sensor 
and this vibration sensor is an actually an iot sensor that actually collects data on uh, inclination and vibration of the bridge from uh, sdt right and based on the data that we have we do a prediction model on um, how the materials of the bridge can be affected by the climates and the, you know throughout, throughout the time so sea bridges you know especially uh, uh, those who are in bridges with the sea they are, when you have uh, you know metals it could be, get easily rusted so um, and um, changing climates can actually affect this kind of rusting. so it's important for us to monitor uh, those data from time to time and iot could do that Equipment tracking, I think IoT helped reduce the time looking for mislead item as well as the cost of purchasing replacement. A lot of GPS data will be already be used to monitor fleet uh, vehicle fleet locations. Okay, and um, it allows activity and landscaping equipment to be precisely positioned. Right. Uh, so this is something like just sim, uh, like the uh, logistics uh, uh, companies they have started to use GPS data to monitor their fleet locations. Right. I think even when you um, just like when you order some food through Uber or you know, um, uh, Zomato, then it's like you could track the drivers. That's that's what we call as a vehicle fleet locations. Um, this is another interesting project. Uh, this is actually a wearable, right? Uh, generally, we know the wearable is used for fitness tracking. Okay, but um, this wearable is like um, an equipment used by backers. Okay. Um, uh, especially when they work in risk uh, nature work job like power drills, you know, uh, article earth movers. So the, uh, we can use IoT to lock their construction hours and their limits can be monitored so as to prevent the work of fatigue and possible accidents. So the variable company in the form of wristbands can also monitor driver health and alertness. Action can be taken if the limits are in danger of being exceeded. So this is very uh, useful to for the welfare of the workers, right? Especially you can actually monitor uh, the health status, uh, whether they're tired or fatigued, and uh, whether, they are, whether, whether they are in the risk locations. So you can actually, you could actually uh, avoid possible accidents. So when you have those use cases, right? Of course, they are fundamental operations, right? Like um, first, you, we need to deal with the collection of data. Generally, it's a sensor oriented. Then we have to process the data, uh, reason it, okay, uh, rule based system, event based processing, or even use machine learning. Once processed, then use the processed data to, to channel to the actuation to control, okay, so we call it sensing based actuation. So these are fundamental operations, but it is not that simple because, as I mentioned earlier, we deal, we are dealing with the sensors that belongs to different domains. So you have temperature sensor, humidity, you have a motion sensor, vibration sensor, and those sensors belong to different domains and they are performing different functionalities. And they, most of the time, they might use different technologies. And not all the sensors are using Wi-Fi. Some might use Bluetooth or other protocols. And likewise, what about the actuators, right? They might use different technologies. So there are a lot of heterogeneity in that, right, differences. And uh, managing them, right? How do you how do we manage them? Okay, Con concerns with the high mobility. So, naming and addressing them. Okay, if you have uh, thousands or two thousand of sensors under the bridge, how do we address that? How do we discover that objects? And uh, how do we process? Are we going to use a semantic web? Okay, or can we have a gateway for that? And standards, all right, it's important because um, whenever we did design an IoT project, we have to comply with the um, standards. Um, because it deals with the, um, uh, whenever we have a census uh, involving human, there should be some ethical clearances. So this is where the standards comes into handy. So standards can help us to promote open data, interoperability, can solve interoperability. They can help us to, to, to give up some good consumer solution. And it's a good, uh, standards also good for engaging manufacturers, right? So it's like bringing all the manufacturers into one and engage them to come up with a proper solution that can ensure that they can produce, uh, you know, systems or devices that can talk to each other. So there are many technologies today, and, and surprisingly, the, uh, most of these companies are actually IT companies, right? They place a role in the IoT ecosystems, right? Uh, you could name it in management, teal components. There are many um, players already there for IoT. 
So for IoT ecosystem, um, to achieve that, we need things to be connected to the software. We need the objects to be made available to use together as a system. And the uh, architecture and the protocol will solve the first one to how to connect to the software. But how to make them available to use the system, there is a challenge. This is what we as a researcher, we have to do. So how standards can help, right? So uh, I think today, uh, normally in academics, very, very um, less initiative we had to look into standard documents. Uh, normally, industry, when they develop products, they will look into standard documents. But I think being a researcher, I think we should, should look into standards as well. So standard is like, you know, when uh, imagine that you have this, um, uh, imagine this is Himalaya mountains, all right? Uh, Himalaya mountains are very rich with resources, right? And there are rivers flowing from the uh, mountains. So imagine that um, in the resources, you have ideas about uh, IoT projects flowing through the river as a value and idea. And before it reaches the community, there are some early adopters. But once it reaches the community, the flow will be very much uh, um, fast. And uh, we might lose much of the ideas to the public sea. Right, so um, this is what happens in many countries when you, when you, when you start a technology-based research, uh, suddenly uh, there is a boom, and much of the idea goes to the uh, waste because there is no clear um, guide or control that. And uh, to control this flow of idea, we need this what we call standards, so that we could uh, systematically document and uh, uh, trajectory them and direct them to better development in the long term, right? So a lot of consortiums, right, like Samsung, Apple, uh, they are doing a lot of things on, you know, on these standards, but uh, it has very little impact to the academics because we are, we are in a different uh, genre. But I think um, it's good to understand the standard documents so that we know where the ecosystem is heading to, right? So we need standards because we want to know what are the new, uh, the latest uh, expectations, what are the latest requirements. Uh, what is the uh, real problem statements that every field has that, right? For instance, the smart grid, they uh, they have many stakeholders. They are not only talking about the utilities, but they are sensors, generators, you know, storage, processor, a lot of stakeholders there, right? Um, as healthcare as well, right? Um, it's never been easy to do a IoT project healthcare because of the complexity. Um, so you have, um, you need to deal with the medical centers, you need to deal with the patients, ethical clearance, right, um, device compatibility and, and so on. Okay, like uh, transportation, same thing, right? Um, in Japan, we have this uh, um, Shinkansen, the, the bullet train. Uh, they are fully IoT enabled. A lot of data has been transferred throughout the um, train while, while the train is running on the platforms. Uh, and a lot of uh, data has been pushed into the cloud. So to, to enable this happen, we need standards. So of course, um, leading companies, right, will use IoT to do gain competitive advantage, and uh, this will uh, result in new application services, both horizontal and vertical market. So I think to benefit from data streams from IoT, we have to deal with large volume data like big data, and we need a new law on privacy, right? So most of the time, we used to see use cases on smart homes, smart cities waste monitoring, you no know, wearables for fitness, which is very much urban centric. So I think it's high time for us to look into the um, socially inclined um, uh, use cases. Maybe for, for instance, forest fire detection using IoT, or even landslide prevention, or river water quality improvement, something that is very close to the social impact. And a lot of things can be done in this kind of use cases. I think, um, uh, this is the right time for every researcher to embark on this such use cases, something that is close to the social norm. So definitely the drivers, you know, the challenges is there. Uh, as I mentioned, there'll be uh, low cost, smaller and smarter sensors. Okay, um, very stable internet is already there, okay, because it's a, a lot of advanced wireless networking protocols for IoT has been there. Of course, the challenges that we are looking at is, is the explosion of the new data. Uh, can we ensure the security? How do we design an IoT projects uh, that actually complies the culture, skills, and business process? And uh, more importantly, can it work with the legacy systems, right? 
uh, nobody wants to develop something that cannot work with the existing system. So it, it is very important for us to to see whether we can bridge the old system and the new system uh, legacy. So what kind of uh, products uh, we should pursue, whether it's open or closed, what kind of data? Uh, these are all the implications, right? And um, normally for academics, uh, it's not an issue because industry will definitely look into this because they need a clear business model, right? So I'll give you an example like a Google Glass. I think uh, it was very popular at one time, but um, it wasn't really accepted by the consumers, right? Uh, because they, uh, not because of the technology, right? The Google Glass did not feel because of the technology, because it wasn't clear to the consumer what problem it solved and why why they need it, it right? So why you want to wear a Google Glass? Are you going to use it to serve the internet? Uh, I could just do it by using my mobile phone or, you know, my laptop. So there, there's real, there is no real um, um, use case that actually supports or justify the need for such device. So as I told you earlier, it's very important for us to define what are the value added services that we could achieve when we have IoT projects. So this is one uh, common mistakes uh, that we do normally. So standards is important, right? But I'm, I'm not going to touch much on standards because um, I, it might not be uh, uh, impactful, but it's good for us to know that the standard document is uh, critical, okay? Um, so that we understand the flow, right? Uh, when we have standards, it actually minimizes the industry and vertical market fragmentation. Uh, it, it helps us to improve the interoperability and allows to, us to build effective IoT projects, actually, when you refer to the standard documents, right? So um, when we talk about user, they always uh, talk about volumes. So and let's say if you want to patent your product in uh, overseas, then you have to look into standards. How does your project or products can be, you know, uh, worked on a cross domain. Um, instead of designing device limited one manufacturer, uh, can you make it for multiple manufacturer? So this is where standards can help us. Right. So definitely there are challenges, okay. Uh, like as I told you, the security and privacy are never ending story. Um, ecosystem, okay, uh, collaborative environments, data exchange formats, um, vendors from the same groups, right? Um, so uh, social implication has to be taken care of as well, right? Um, very important when we design uh, IoT project, it should not burden the uh, public. It should be very much um, uh, adaptable, right? So a careful requirement analysis is needed. Uh, clear uh, consensus on choosing the right technology is also needed, right? So academics and industry, they could play a very important role in um, participating in the IoT standardization, right? Um, what we call this harmonization, right? Uh, that avoids one size fits all approach, right? So I think um, students or new researchers do not worry. If you have a project idea, I think you just you could just get started. Even though if you don't have time to look into standards, I think just go just get get it started and then um, start to fulfill the requirement uh, gradually, step by step, until you get a full fledged game product, right? Uh, it will take time because a lot of testing needed and along the way we will pick up some new um, components right to to see right so um interoperability okay there are many layers right so uh, by having the standards we can actually solve the interoperability so one um, at the moment we most of the iot projects are in the level three uh, semantic interoperability we have solved technical interoperability, we have soft synthetic, and we are here in the semantic interoperability. And in the coming years, I think we are climbing up to other uh, level of interoperabilities, right? So this is another big um, chapter to discuss, okay? But I'll give you some um, insights in the coming modules. So some predictions, I think organizations are telling us how the IoT world will be standardized. There'll be Darwinian-like evolution driven by the market. Um, consumers will be attracted to the applications. They will buy things that connect. They will keep the devices they can trust. And different IoT application consumers will succeed if they can connect the devices in trouble-free and secure way. I think that's very important. And uh, we have to keep in mind that we have to create a project that is actually uh, trouble-free and very much secure. Okay. So some takeaway. Uh, 
we know that in the past we don't have much um, uh, interoperation between solutions for IoT. Today, proprietary solutions are being still developed, pushed. But I think in future we we are looking to integrations, right? So um, uh, the, the trend has changed. Changes. I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the time has come that I think the uh, engineering students has to work with the uh, life science students. The life science students has to work with the uh, business students. The business student might need to work with the uh, social science students, right? So you have a multi, you need a multidisciplinary team to embark on uh, IoT projects today because uh, we need domain experts and we need to understand the problem statement from those domain experts before we could translate into IoT ecosystem. So I give you a scenario here. Okay, <clears throat> um, if you look at this diagram here, you'll see there is a smart home. Uh, there is a smart vehicle, uh, there is a medical center, and there is an intelligent traffic monitoring system. Okay. Uh, typically, all right, in a classical way, okay, um, if you look, if you read many white papers or research articles, they will say that there is a patient in a smart home, and that's, that patient's uh, body has been uh, equipped with many sensors, and uh, the patient might be an elderly patient. So when the patient falls, the sensor will trigger the ambulance to come and pick up the patient. Okay, this is a very classical way, a very traditional way, telemedicine, right? So when the elderly patient falls, the sensor triggers, the ambulance come and pick up the patient to the hospital. Okay, but this is not going to be the scenario in IoT ecosystem in coming years. What is going to happen is that the moment the patient falls, the sensor won't send the data to the ambulance. Instead, it will send the data to the traffic monitoring system, to the medical center, and also the local council. Okay, the reason is that we have many stakeholders today in a city, right? In highly populated countries, um, to transport a patient in real time, you need, uh, there are many challenges, right? So a lot of decision making has to be done in a very fast manner, rapidly. So the moment a patient falls in a home, the sensor will alert the local traffic monitoring system to clear the route of the traffic from the hospital to the patient's home. The police, the local police station will be in, uh, informed. The medical center will be informed with the requirement. So by the time the patient reaches the hospital, everything is well planned, well prepared, meaning that there is no traffic jam. There is no roadblocks. Uh, there are no um, like, um, you know, um, uh, obstacles. So there are smooth schedule uh, or route planned by the algorithms to transport the patients to the hospital because in such in such mechanism, such scenario, you need many intelligent algorithms to realize such project. Okay, so this is our work. This is what we call as um, cognitive IoT, and I'm I'm working on this with my you know, uh, postgraduate students. So um, if I have an opportunity, we, I I will share with you some outcomes on uh, this project in the future. So some research directions, I think uh, we can look into interoperability. Um, each computing, right? Uh, how do you process data before it reaches the cloud? Semantic technologies, ontologies, okay, for different use cases. Power management, solar, renewable energy, security, okay, new encryption methods, architectures, dependencies, okay, human in the loop, setup and implementation issues, right? Uh, context aware, okay, the rule systems, data mining, classifications, right? Finding the accuracies, all right? Uh, wearable technologies, and then uh, of course, multidisciplinary approach is uh, very uh, important today. Right? So these are the some uh, resources, right? Uh, basically, if you want to get more information, uh, I would suggest that you read uh, IEEE P2413. It's a freely available. Uh, this could give you a complete uh, hands-on, or I would say an um, overview on what is all about IoT ecosystems, right? Uh, a very good deck document for for beginners, right? And then uh, other links are more on the protocols, right? There could be uh, some reading as well. And these are the documents available in the uh, consortiums. Okay, they they sometimes very they might be very technical, but uh, you could choose whatever um, if you want to get idea about use cases. I think these are the uh, links that could help you. Okay, um, some references. Okay, that I, I used for today's um, uh, presentation. Right, okay, so I think uh, we have come to an end. So I do welcome um, if you have any questions, right? 
So I pass the baton to Dr. Amin. Thank you, sir. I think we can take a take a few questions yeah. if you have. Yes. Okay. Uh, then, sir, probably maybe I can ask you. Yeah. Uh, so for a IOT, sir, probably we are talking about that IOT will probably take place in our day to day life. OK, yes. And, yeah. uh, and probably it will solve our most of the problem. Now, what yeah. with the adverse effect of the IOT? Because whatever the waves that they are generating, that ah, could be okay. also the uh, issue for uh, uh, our health also. Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. we are surrounded by so many IOT sensors, but whatever yes, the sir. waves that are those generating, that yeah. could also may be harmful to us. OK, OK, uh, that, that's a good question, sir. Uh, I appreciate you asked the question because uh, uh, normally I, I get this kind of question. Many, many people ask about 5G, um, uh, you know, uh, because 5G, one, one of the clusters in 5G is actually IoT. What happened when you have a lot of waves around us? Uh, of course, um, if you look at medically, uh, there are a lot of uh, health uh, effects. Um, there might be some evidence that there might not be some evidence, but uh, telcos are denying it. Telcos are not giving us a right um, uh, answer about this. But I think as a user, as a consumer, or as a responsible citizen, uh, we have to be uh, careful in device deployment. So like uh, when, you, when you work on a use case on an IoT ecosystem, as I told you, try to incline them towards a sustainable development goal, uh, probably limiting the device uh, a number of devices or uh, installing in a radius that is not affecting the uh, housing boards or uh, installing in, uh, devices in uh, beyond um, children care centers you know uh, out of the cities um, outskirts not affecting the village or not affecting the agricultural um, 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 areas so this has to be part of the uh, requirement so uh, a responsible i think a researcher or even uh, industry should include include this as part of the uh, you know uh, I would say uh, uh, their corporate responsibility, right? Uh, it will take some time, but I think um, the the new generation has to has to play an important role on this. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a one question from Modi that uh, he would like to know about the uh, different job scenario which could yeah. be available for the IoT. Okay. If, if we have a uh, fundamental knowledge in IoT, I think uh, the first uh, preferences by the industry is about analytics. Uh, they they want to know whether we are familiar with the uh, analytics, data analytics, uh, using different IoT uh, platforms. So, um, uh, of course, there are other jobs like you know, like um, startups now they are looking into um, like bespoke solution, like you develop an IoT. Uh, you know water quality um, you develop uh, IOT pro products for uh, utility uh, so it depends so how the job will affect it okay um, uh, post COVID-19 uh, I think um, things won't change much but uh, uh, I think it's good for for the students to pick up some knowledge on uh, uh, data science as well right so we will see a lot of uh, physical jobs uh, moving into autonomous job. So data science might be like um, uh, preferable right after this. Okay. Then I have another question here. Can there be a separate internet in future, specifically providing security and not being dependent? Okay. Uh, yes, that there, there is possibility that our IoT device uh, being run on a separate channel. Okay. Uh, not intersecting with our daily, um, uh, you know, like um, um, uh, traditional internet. So I read somewhere that low orbit satellites implementing 5G technology could help this happening. Yes. So they want to reduce the interference. So they are like having a different, um, you know, um, separate channels for that. So this could happen. But right now we don't have a large scale of IoT devices. So it's very early to say that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
uh, i think one more question i think hirani would, would like to ask you yeah. hirani uh, you can unmute your mic and you can ask please go ahead hello hello hirani yeah uh, yeah sir uh, you touched on the challenges that we face while implementing iot uh, yeah. i i wanted to know like uh, uh, what can be said about the hardware challenges that may come in while implementing an iot solution like that google glass example you took uh, you said that there was no technological problem as such yeah. but adoption problem was there so yeah. i think uh, it was more like let's say if it would have been under 100 dollars yeah. i think more people would have been like you know everybody would have given it a shot like let's see exactly so yeah. i mean how do you overcome that because a lot of things that we come up with like even uh, while earlier when people were giving ideas mm -hmm. so when you think about it it's like you know uh, sometimes you have to use a very state of the art hardware to make it uh, feasible correct correct, correct. Yes. so so like how do you uh, address that or deal with that okay so you see um, uh, the trend today is like many uh, when you talk about hardware much of this hardware uh, prototypes or productions uh, dominated by china and uh, us so um, in, in china i think if you want to design a schematic um i think they have everything because most of the countries they are sending the schematic to china they have like um uh, all the designs of the schematics so they know what's happening all around the world so to address this i think we have to do a, a like a local um a low cost fabrications so a, a lo lot of things that we can actually um, produce by not depending on uh, external uh, help so uh, it's high time that we have to look into like uh, producing low cost prototypes uh, that is using our own uh, schematic design uh, using our own uh, prototype material and using our own fabrication machines right so by by doing this you actually pro you are protecting your your invention at the same time you are, you could produce in a low cost by not depending on uh, high end or advanced parts so this is what happens when arduino and raspberry pi came into the scenario they actually shifted the um, uh the hardware agenda is like the, the uh, hardware cost has gone too too low because of this open source hardware so i think uh we have to emulate such um uh, strategy as well yeah. yeah okay sir thank you thank you sir i think probably the last question from gps jv i think uh, he is uh, asking that sir is a data science analytics is same as we talk about big data oh okay uh, the big data is the big umbrella and uh, data science and uh, analytics is part of the big data it's like big data is the big chunk of umbrella and uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, branch is actually a data science and analytics okay. and under the big data you have database you have database and analysis you have uh, distributed systems so data science and analytics is one branch of big data Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Ah, uh, I think uh, with that uh, we can stop here for today. So, okay. sir, will be joining with us tomorrow also at the same time. Yeah. And uh, tomorrow, sir, will talk about the assistive living and IoT. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Have a nice day, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day, and thanks for everyone for your uh, good feedback and questions today. I would truly appreciate that. Okay okay thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir thank you thank you Okay participants then that's all from today so we will again meet tomorrow at the same time 2 o'clock so tomorrow we have a lecture schedule 2 to 4 okay thank you